Today we're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark or the Book of Mark, and we'll be in Mark chapter 1, and we're going to be beginning in verse 14. So we're going to get right to it today, Mark 1, 14. Listen now for the Word of God. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and they followed him. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, let's pray. Well, Father, we do come to you today as a people in need of your grace and your mercy, as a people who often don't understand. Father, we need your leadership in our lives. And so, as we come to your word today, we, we want to come under it. And we want to come under your leadership. And we want to learn from you. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would take these words of Holy Scripture and you would press them deeply into our hearts and deeply into our lives. That they would be your words. And I pray that anything that is in me would just fall away and that we would see you, Jesus. And that your power would transform us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are a few weeks now into our series on Mark. And so far, we, we've mostly gotten prologue and introduction. But today, we begin to really see Jesus at work and Jesus' ministry beginning and Jesus on the move. And so he 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 begins in a little bit of a a little bit of an a surprising way or a peculiar way. Jesus begins by calling men unto himself. And it's kind of it's kind of surprising in the sense that in the the religious traditions of that time, rabbis did not typically call students or followers unto themselves, but students or followers or learners would go and seek out a rabbi and they would want to ask to be able to follow that rabbi. So Jesus kind of does it the opposite way. He, he tends to do that, sort of turn everything upside down. And another thing that's surprising or a little peculiar about what Jesus does here is, is as he calls these men unto himself, he says to follow me. And again, in the religious traditions of the time, rabbis would say, they wouldn't say follow me, but they would say follow the Torah, follow the teachings. And so, again, Jesus kind of turns things on their head here. He says, follow me. And it's almost as if there's a transition going on from following the traditions to, uh, of, of, reli of religious traditions to following Jesus in a relationship with him. So kind of this transition from religion to relationship is going on. And then uh, another, another thing that I think is really worth noting here is that what Jesus does in this passage from Mark chapter 1 is something that changes the course of human history as he calls these men to follow him. Because if you think about it, right, it, as he calls these men and as they follow him, ultimately they change the world. You and I would not be here today in a church. We would not be ourselves disciples of Jesus if it were not for these first disciples who followed him and were willing to, to give everything to build the church. So, changed history. Now, the, the book of Mark, 
that, that we're just early into here. The book of Mark, among other things, we could say the book of Mark is a, a handbook for us. It is a handbook on discipleship. And it's written for people like you and like me, people who are not eyewitnesses of Jesus, people who did not live at the time that Jesus lived and didn't experience him firsthand. It's written just, just like that for people like you and for me to learn what it means to trust Jesus and to follow Jesus. And to, as he says, to, to come to him, to follow him. We begin to learn what that means in the book of Mark. Now, having said all of that as kind of an introduction today, what, what, what I find in Mark 1, 14 through 20 is that I think there, there are three main things that are, that are important for us to draw out of this. Perhaps we could say Mark wants us to take these away from, from his writing today, and, and they are these. They're all about being a follower of Jesus, all about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And I think what we begin to learn from Mark chapter 1 here is that we learn that being a follower of Jesus or being a disciple is something that is distinct being a disciple is something that is drastic, and being a follower of Jesus is something that is deliberate. And I'm going to unpack those in turn. So being a follower of Jesus is distinct. It is, there's something very distinct and particular about that. And, and, and I, would, I would begin by, by drawing out of verses 14 and 15, those first verses. They really set this message apart. They really set Jesus apart. Jesus uh, says, Jesus, after John was arrested, says Jesus came to Galilee. He was proclaiming the gospel of God. He was saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So the two things that I think are very distinct that set this message apart are these two words, gospel and kingdom. Gospel and kingdom. The, these words set this apart. Now the first, the gospel. What is that? What is the gospel? Well, very literally, that word gospel means good news. Good news. It would be used in Jesus' time. It would have been used for things like... Uh, a new Caesar has been born, right? It's good news for the kingdom. Right? Go and tell everyone. Or perhaps a, a military victory has been won on, on behalf of the people. Send out messengers to let everyone know. Victory. Victory has been won. This is good news. This is gospel. That might be how this word gospel would have been used in Jesus' time. Of course, we know that the gospel of Jesus has incredible implications for us. This, this good news that in Jesus, we are forgiven of our sins. That in Jesus, we have access to God. This is good and wonderful news worthy of proclaiming. So the gospel, it's, a, it's this declaration. Sometimes in the church, we get this idea that the gospel is advice or it's things we should do. But really, the gospel is a declaration of what has already been done for us. That our sins have been forgiven, that we have been made right with God and Jesus. Send out the messengers to proclaim the good news, right? New life has come. It's the gospel, right? And, and this, this is distinct about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. The other word I, I mentioned, there was gospel. And then Jesus talks about the kingdom. Now, the kingdom of God is anywhere where Jesus reigns. Anywhere where Jesus is Lord is his kingdom. And Jesus shows up and he's talking about the kingdom and he's giving a glimpse of what ultimately the kingdom is going to be about, that it's going to be about restoration, like about the restoration of Genesis 1 and creation and life as it was originally intended to be. He's going to be talking about how this is a restoration of the peace or the shalom that we are to have with God and with one another and how he came and laid down his life to, to restore these things that he was going to make right what we had made wrong, what we had broken, that he came to make that right and to, to, to bring the power to heal, the power to renew, the power to restore, that Jesus brought these. And these were key parts of what his kingdom, the kingdom of God, would be about. 
And so Jesus says, this kingdom, it's, it is on the way. It is on the move. Get ready. It is coming, right? So he's about the gospel and he's about the kingdom. And these, these are things that, that make it very distinct to, to be a disciple of Jesus, that we are people about the gospel. And we are people about his kingdom. So then he goes on and he says in verse 15, he says, he finishes it by saying, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. And then these are kind of action words for us to do as we walk with Jesus, as we, as he says, as we follow Jesus to repent and believe two words full of meaning to repent. Simply if we're walking towards sinful ways, it simply means to stop and to turn away from that direction and to, and to orient our lives toward Jesus and to run toward him, to repent, to change our ways, to change our direction. And then to believe, right? To trust that Jesus is who he said he is. And he did what he said he would do. And that he brings life and he brings hope and he brings healing and he brings restoration to believe on him. And so Jesus comes and he makes this announcement to his first followers to repent and to believe. So there's a very, these are things that are very distinct, very particular about what it means to follow Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus. That's the first thing that, that we see in Mark 1 beginning in 14. The second is this, is to be a disciple of Jesus is something, is something drastic, right? There's something radical about being a follower of Jesus. Something radical about that, drastic about that. Because when we are followers of Jesus or when we are disciples of Jesus, it means that we, we place Jesus in a position of, of, of superiority over everything in our lives, that he is Lord of everything in our lives. And that is, that is something that is rather drastic in our lives. He's Lord of our life, Lord of our work, Lord of our family, Lord of our friends, Lord of everything within us and about us. He is supreme. That's hard for us as human beings because we tend to like to think of ourselves as being kind of the Lord of our own, you know, the, the king of our own kingdom, right? My kingdom may be small, but it's good to be the king, right? <laughs> Um, we, we have something called ego that makes us feel like we are the one that is supreme over our life. Uh, um, there was, don't put the picture up yet, Nicole, but there, there was a few years ago, Megan and I with some other friends, we were in Sucre, Bolivia, and we went, we went on vacation mainly just to, just to chill out, but we did a hike while we were there. We wanted to see the countryside a little bit and we set up a hike. Megan, Megan calls it the trail of tears, right? Because we just wanted an easy downhill half day hike. We weren't asking for much, right? But we seemed to have a little, something was lost in translation with the tour guide or, or the hiking guide. I think, I think she really wanted to, to get paid for a full day hike and she won. So we ended up on this, you know, once you're on it, you're kind of like stuck. So we ended up on this all day hike. It was very high, like 12 and a half thousand feet hike. So we were just we were kind of dying on this thing, um, but it was kind of cool because we, we wanted to see some of the Incan trail and we saw cave drawings along the way. So these kind of ancient, I don't remember the time frame, but ancient people lived in ancient caves there that you could still see. And we, we saw those and, and Nicole, if you'd put the picture up, um, this is, I probably could have found a better picture if I Googled it, but this was actually my picture, but there were th these cave drawings the, the spirals you see, they're kind of they're kind of rough spirals, but there are these spirals all over these caves. And I share that because the, the guide said the anthropologists believed that those spirals were like a so they were significant or they were symbolic of the people at that time felt like they were the center of the universe. And 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 she said this was like their symbol for, for ego, basically. And you hear that and you kind of think, wow, nothing really changes, right? <laughs> I mean, ancient cave drawings about human ego, feeling like you're the center of the universe, the center of the known world. And, and don't we sometimes feel that way as well? We, we have to fight against that part of our humanity that we feel like, I feel like sometimes I'm the center of the world, right? That it's all about me. <laughs> and it kind of it stuck with me that, that um, you know, that, 
the, the opposite of that is to put Jesus as the supreme authority and Lord over my life say that he's going to be the Lord over me and I am not the center of the universe and my ego is not going to reign supreme. So this is, this is about a radical commitment. This is about a passion for Jesus to be the priority over everything in your life. Now we want to do that. But I know what often happens is we say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life and I will follow you. I mean, if, you know, if you'll help me in my job, help me get that raise, right? Help this girl become my wife or whatever it might be. It's sort of a Jesus and I will follow, you know, but also I want you to like make my life better in these ways. We tend to do that because of that that sense of ego within us. We don't, we don't, we're not very good at letting someone else be the Lord of our life. And so this is a radical call to be a disciple of Jesus and to drop our nets and to follow him and say, yes, Lord, you are the Lord of every bit of my life. And we do that. It's basically that we want to come to Jesus, but we also want to get something from Jesus, right? I want to come to Jesus, but I'd like to get that raise at my job too. Or I want to follow Jesus, but I want these things to work out for me, you know, for, for the better in my life. And, and people did this in Jesus' day as well. They wanted to follow, they wanted to follow Jesus. Well, I want to get this ailment healed, right? Or, or I want to follow Jesus. I want to see something miraculous happen. And these things do happen. But, but the truth is that if we want Jesus, we've got to come to him for who he is. As, as the com lowest common denominator, we've got to come to Jesus for Jesus. And then we will get all of these other things. But if we come to Jesus simply to get something, those things will fall right through our fingers, right through our grasp. And we won't get them and we won't get Jesus. We have to come to Jesus for who he is. We have to come to Jesus for Jesus. And that is a radical calling in our life. That's a radical calling. And we have to, coming to Jesus, we have to give up our own, our own self and our own self-centeredness and our own selfishness and be transformed by him. So, being a follower of Jesus, it is distinct. It is a distinct and particular calling. Being a follower of Jesus, it, it is drastic. It is something radical about us, right? I think we probably like to think of ourselves as moderate people, right? We're moderate. We're nice people, right? But he's calling us to be radicals, radicals for, for him, right? What's that song? That, yeah, that, what was that album? <laughs> Jesus Freaks, right? Jesus Freaks. Yeah, can you play that ever? I don't know. <laughs> remember that that's like 90s 80s 80s 90s music probably 90s christian music we're to be yeah we're to be radical for jesus the final thing about being a disciple of jesus is that it is a deliberate calling or another way to put that is that it is a process discipleship is process oriented verse 17 jesus says follow me and i will make you become fishers of men. There's a process to this in becoming something for Jesus. Fishers of men. What, a, what does that mean? I, I think that has something to do, obviously, with salvation, about people coming to a saving, a saving knowledge of Christ. I think even larger than that, fishers of men has something to do with holistic holistic, all-encompassing healing for our lives as we follow Jesus, right? And I think it's also something that is incremental. It often doesn't happen instantaneously. I don't know if you've ever gone fishing. You know, it typically doesn't happen instantaneously. There's probably a lot more time sitting around doing the fishing than doing the catching, right? It's a process. This is a process as well. And I think the great example of this in the story is Peter. Now this talks about Simon and his brother, Andrew. This Simon is the same as Simon Peter, the same as the Peter we see throughout the gospels and the acts and the letters. This is Peter. And Peter's a great example of sort of the process of discipleship. We, we see here that Peter becomes a, he becomes a follower of Jesus. And then we see in, in Acts, 
that at the Pentecost, Peter preaches and 3,000 people come to a saving faith in Jesus. But these things didn't happen. It wasn't instantaneous. There was a process. There was a lot of things that happened between Peter being a fisherman and Peter becoming a fisher of men. Okay, a lot happened in there, and we we you know we know with with Peter, it's understood that the book of Mark is Peter's experience of Jesus, and so Peter tells his experiences to Mark, who writes them down, right? And then it's Mark's gospel, but it's Peter's experiences. And the interesting thing about that is that <clears throat> Peter doesn't come across like looking great throughout the Gospels, right? He's putting his foot in his mouth. He's making mistakes. He doesn't understand sometimes, right? He looks foolish at times. I mean, if I were to write a book about myself, I would make sure, to, you know, that I looked really good throughout the book, you know, minimize the bad stuff, maximize the good stuff, accentuate the positive. Um, but Peter's very real in this. And I, I like that. It kind of gives it authenticity. And we see, you know, Peter, Peter, you know, if he's very impulsive, oftentimes he makes mistakes. But we see in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 8, there's an inflection point in Peter's walk and his process of becoming a disciple. That's when Jesus asks the question. He says, who do people say that I am? And then Peter responds and he says that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yeah, ding, ding, right, right answer, right? Peter's beginning to understand more. But then Jesus says, now we're going to go to Jerusalem or I'm going to die. Peter didn't like that so much. Said, no, no, we're never going to let that happen to you because like, we got this movement. We're just gaining momentum. We're going to make this thing happen. You can't go off dying right now. And then if you remember Jesus' response to him, and he said, get behind me, Satan. Right? So Peter's, Peter has this faith-seeking understanding. He is growing, but he also just doesn't get it. But this is kind of an inflection point in Peter's understanding. It's all to say that it was a process. Peter didn't instantaneously go from being a fisherman to a fisher of men. It took some years of growth, some years of change within his heart to become the man that he would become in building up the church of Jesus. And it's the same for us. It's the same for us, right? You think about the, the command in this text in verse 17, um, Jesus said to them, uh, did, did he command them to become fishers of men? He didn't, he didn't like say, you become fishers of men. No, he, he told them, follow me. That's the command in this text. Follow me. And then he says, I will make you, I will make you to become fishers of men. When we follow him, he's going to begin to work in us and change us and transform us. And in a way, you could say what Jesus is doing here is that he's modeling what he wants to see in these men. He's modeling what it means to be a fisher of men as he calls them to himself. And sometimes that's the best way to teach. It's one thing to tell someone to do something. It's another thing to show them how to do it. And here he's showing them how to be a fisher of men as he calls them to himself. Now, if we're going to be, and when, and when we use this language, fishers of men, I, you know, it's broad, broadly spoken, fishers of all people, right? Men, women, children, everyone. But if we're going to become fishers of men, there's a couple of things that have to happen in us. The first, the first is that we have to have our self-centeredness and our selfishness, our ego. We have to have it healed because we're so driven. We're so driven by these things as human beings. And as we trust in Jesus, we need him to heal us of our self-centeredness. We need him to make us more like him, more humble, more concerned about others, more compassionate as we become followers of Jesus, as we begin to be transformed into fishers of men, these things need to begin to happen in our hearts by the power of Jesus. And we will become more, more and more like him. For me to become a fisher of men, you know, God's got to heal these things within me. And second, second is this. 
as these things begin to get worked out in you, your self-centeredness begins to be, to be um, taken out of you, as you begin to be healed in this way, you will begin to draw people to yourself because you are more Christ-like. And, you know, people, people are drawn to others who are, if, if, you, if you represent a Christ-like life, that's not, you know, that, that's humble, that's compassionate, that genuinely cares about others, people will be drawn to that. Don't you love to be around people like that, right? Most of us don't want to be around someone who's arrogant and selfish, right? That's off-putting. But we'll be drawn to people, or people will be drawn to you as you become more like Jesus, more humble, more compassionate, more genuinely caring for others, right? And we begin to become fishers of men as we follow Jesus in that way. The problem is this, right? It's always a problem. The problem is that we are generally not very good at being followers. As human beings, it's sometimes the last thing we want to do is to follow someone else, to do what they say, to let them take charge of our lives. And, and so there's a transformation that has to take place in our life to follow Jesus, to be his disciples, to be healed by him, this has to take place uh, because he has a plan to heal you. He has a plan to draw you out of your self-absorption and to make you a fisher of men. But it is deliberate and it is a process. It is a process. So as we begin to, to wrap it up, uh, I'll share what I think is one of the best parts of this text and then um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll finish up together. I think one of the best parts of this text is, is who Jesus calls. Jesus comes and he calls Simon and his brother Andrew and James and John. Now, do these men have what you would call prerequisites to be leaders in the church? What do you think? No, no, I don't, I don't think they're fisher. I mean, they're just fishermen, right? And he comes to them at their workplace, at their boats, and he calls them. You would kind of think like, like if we were to sit down and be thinking of how would this story go if I were to write it, you'd think, well, Jesus might have gone to the church and he might have asked for the board of elders and he might have wanted to find the people that were most experienced, right? And most knowledgeable and had, you know, were the best leaders to come and to help him start this movement. And you would kind of think that, but that's not what Jesus did. He went to people who, I'm not saying they were bad people, but they probably lacked what we would think would be the prerequisites for this calling. He went to, to, to simple people who were blue-collar laborers, who probably were not well-educated, and he invited them to follow him and to become fishers of men, and that's just what they did. And I think, um, you know, that, that's no, no knock on... on studying or being well prepared or academics or any of that those are all good things but but i think this should give us a lot of hope it means there's not a bunch of things that you have to have figured out already to be a follower of jesus you don't have to have all the answers to be a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be the greatest leader in the room to be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple. It means you can start right now where you are with what you've got, and that's enough for Jesus to work with. He can work with that if you will respond to that call, that call of Jesus to come and follow me. Come and follow me. Come, he says, wherever you are, come. And he calls you to himself. I think that's great news. I think that gives me a lot of hope. So where do we go with that? Where do we go as we want to become disciples of Jesus or as we want to continue to grow in our life as disciples of Jesus? I think the, I think the, the next thing is just to be always asking, what's next? Jesus, what's that? where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to grow and learn to always be looking for that next step? to grow and to be transformed in this process of discipleship, right? Because there's always, there's always going to be some area of our life that we're needing to, to give to Jesus, to give over to his lordship. 
There are always some areas of our life we want to hold on to. And so what's next? What's he calling you to next? So I think that's the, the next question. So today, today, brothers and sisters, come, come and follow him. Come and be fishers of men. Come and receive his heart and his love. Come and be changed and be transformed and be a disciple. It is a distinct calling. It is a drastic calling. It is a deliberate calling to respond to him. Follow him wherever that next step may lead you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your calling upon our lives. We thank you for that great news that wherever we are, whatever we've got right now, that you call us to follow you so that you can make us fishers of men. And we pray that we would be faithful to the task, Lord, and we would trust in you more than our egos and more than our abilities, that we would give it all to you. And we would come to you because because of who you are and not just because of what we can get. So Father God, be about a work of changing and transforming us, that we would be a people faithful unto you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the love that we have in you and that we can give to others because of you. And in your name we do pray. Amen and amen.